the previous video clip, there are a few regimes of severe thunderstorm threat assessment that we're going to be focusing in on during this summertime uh, convective outlook. And I'm going to talk about some of the underlying principles of how the severe storm ingredients are coming together in each of these cases, but being brought about together in different ways. So again, it's the same ingredients supporting severe storm and threat, but the actual ways in which the environmental conditions all come together are going to vary from location to location, which is why the details are so important for understanding those, those uh, governing physical principles to perform the severe thunderstorm threat assessment. Let's just consider a rough outline of the contiguous United States, something like this, uh, Rocky Mountains out west. And I'm going to draw a rough approximate 500 millibar height pattern over here uh, with ridging, hot days over the western plateau vicinity, something like this, uh, shortwave trough moving off the coast of the east coast. Uh, here's some more height contours over here kind of illustrating the overall pattern. And let's uh, talk about what might be happening at the surface associated with this pattern over here. Might have some surface low within a zone of differential cyclonic vortices convection now moving off the coast with a trailing cold front towards Florida vicinity, for instance. Uh, perhaps some warm front branching off to the east over the Gulf Stream waters into western parts of the North Atlantic Ocean. If you would think of the more traditional warm sector, I'm going to start outlining um, a sample 60 degree Fahrenheit isodrosotherm. And we'd have something more of a defined warm sector off the coast over here, a more strongly forced regime uh, in terms of convective threat extending off the coast. Here's our 60 Fahrenheit isodrosotherm. And in the summertime, we don't necessarily have as strong a front as we do during the winter time, for instance, with more of an amplified pattern into the winter time. It's much more challenging, as we know, in the summertime to completely scour out the richest moisture. And so there'll be a tendency for, if you want to say, a partially modified Gulf moisture or recycled moisture to circulate around the high pressure system evolving within the zone of differential anticyclonic vorticity advection on the backside of that mid level disturbance. That that uh, sample 60 Fahrenheit isojosotherm will effectively represent the circulation of moisture around the backside of that system over here along anticyclonic trajectories on the upstream side of that mid-level shortwave trough over here. And depending on the amount of Lee troughing, its overall extent, you know, that recycled moisture could potentially extend pretty far northward of the High Plains area beneath westerly to northwesterly flow aloft. And so we're going to be looking at a more classical northwest flow cases across parts of the High Plains, the upper Mississippi Valley, which are going to be evolving in a weaker forcing or more modestly forcing for ascent regime compared to what might be going on um, off the coast over here. And then, of course, we're going to be talking about Harvey as well. So again, when we're talking about the summertime, and fronts aren't going to be as strong or extend as far south in terms of their overall most intense strengths, um, there's going to be an opportunity for moisture to much more efficiently work its way back northward beneath the westerly and northwesterly flow aloft on the upstream side of the shortwave trough around the differential anticyclonic vorticity advection reinforced surface high pressure system than it would during the winter time when there's a much greater tendency for these systems to more completely scour the moisture out, replacing higher theta E air with lower theta E air. And as we bring this partially modified Gulf moisture or recycled moisture back to the north, we're not talking about the fully modified Gulf moisture trajectories that have been sitting out over the ocean coming to an equilibrium temperature over a longer time period. We're talking about somewhat weaker moisture, but still, in this particular case, just a sample 60 Fahrenheit isodrosotherm, this entire area is going to be lying beneath a zone of strong mixed layer developing over the higher plateau, western plateau, and then overspreading differentially uh, the uh, low level moisture working back northward to the west or in the return flow pattern um, to the west of the surface anticyclone. 
And so by taking, you know, we're, we're talking about the summertime ridging over the western United States, a very potentially warm, hot conditions at the surface over the western plateau, supporting the development of a deep, well-mixed layer. That can be advected over that plume of recycled moisture extending to the northward, east of whatever leak troughing can materialize, and that differential advection by which we're having the lapse rate advection, that's right from the lapse rate tendency equation, where we have the boost to mid-level lapse rates being driven by the positive advection of lapse rates emanating from the higher plateau, will be coming, working its way eastward over that richer moisture plume coming to the north in the return flow pattern on the back side of the surface anticyclone. And that differential vection is going to foster, particularly in summertime when we get pretty strong surface heating and boosts in low level lapse rates, this entire corridor lighting up with buoyancy or cape, which would otherwise be uh, devoid of buoyancy within the uh, colder season, deeper into the winter season, owing to the full scouring out of moisture um, as we head towards the winter time. So we're going to have this entire cor corridor of buoyancy light up east of, the, uh, east of the Rocky Mountain Front Range beneath a zone of very weak forcing for ascent. Remember, our stronger uh, vertical motion, more apparent differential cyclonic vortex convection is going to be focused e uh, ahead of the shortwave trough. When we get into a regime of larger scale differential anticyclonic vortex convection, it's going to be much more challenging to pick up on lifting mechanisms. And a lot of the time, they're going to be much more subtle, like forcing for ascent accompanying uh, mesoscale convective vorticity embedded in the flow that are convectively driven, differential heating boundaries offering baroclinicity and associated upward motion along those zones of baroclinicity related to differential heating from uh, leftover episodes of convective and associated convective debris over spreading buoyant plumes, um, forcing for ascent along the lead trough, uh, for instance, uh, and just overall ascent along uh, diurnally enhanced uh, planetary boundary layer circulations, for instance. Those can all contribute to the forcing for ascent, but they're all going to be much more subtle, much more mesoscale driven, predictability will lower, but there can still be a vast area of conditional severe weather threat. And we're going to focus on some of those details for lifting mechanisms um, as we will continue to see within the various, uh, within the various video clips from the convective outlook uh, preparation that I have performed. And so that's going to be one regime over here across the high plains area as we get the differential advection, this overspread of mid-level lapse rates atop the recycled moisture working its way back northward because it wasn't fully scoured out. Um, certainly embedded speed maxima, MCVs, um, enhancing mid-level height gradients are going to help encourage the overspreading of the steeper, steeper, steeper mid-level lapse rates over the high plains, for instance, to generate a more convectively unstable environment um, as well. So that's going to be one particular phenomenon, the recycled moisture plume, the high plains area, that we're going to put more and more focus on in terms of how these ingredients come together. So again, same ingredients have to come together. It's not like there's, uh, you know, we can have different physics across the country support severe weather episodes. It's the same physics. It's the same, um, the same ingredients have to come together. But the circumstances that foster their simultaneous overlap in time and space will vary from regime to regime. Another regime um, is going to be related to the tropical cyclone. So let's, let's put Harvey uh, somewhere here. over the Gulf of Mexico approaching the Texas coast. And we know that with these tropical cyclones, they're going to be carrying substantial amounts of theta E to the north within their eastern semicircle. That is, with the lower latitudes closer to the equator being a very common source region for rich amounts of moisture and a large uh, amount of uh, potential for convective development within that zone of greater instability or related to the richer moisture that's being pulled to the north. That's going to be a favored semicircle within the eastern semicircle for high theta air to be brought to the north. On the other hand, when we're talking about the western semicircle of these systems, as they interact with somewhat drier air over the continental areas, they're going to have a tendency of supporting negative theta E advection to the, in the western semicircles, resulting in a depletion of buoyancy and theta E deficits, 
more commonly focused within the Western semicircles of the system. So the zone of greater potential instability is going to have a tendency of focusing within the Eastern semicircle of these systems. At the same time, this tropical cyclone representing a per, uh, pressure deficit or negative perturbation pressure is going to be um, interacting with relatively higher pressures over uh, the inland areas and is going to focus a zone over the northern semicircle of much stronger pressure gradient, which is going to translate to stronger low-level shear as we have the frictional stunting of the near surface winds, then the winds were be increasing substantially with height above ground and responding to that tightening pressure gradient as the system moves inland. And so that, fav that favors a uh, northern semicircle focused zone of stronger low level shear across a northern semicircle and the overlap of strong low level shear and stronger buoyancy related to those ample poleward transport of high thady air will tend to overlap within the northeastern quadrant of these systems. That's where we have both the low-level shear overlapping with the greater buoyancy associated with this polar fluxes of higher theta E air. Now, Edwards 2012 points out, that's Roger Edwards, a lead forecaster of the Storm Prediction Center, points out the importance of looking at this in terms of a Cartesian reference frame. Because if you all of a sudden have a southward moving system, it's still going to be the northeast quadrant and also going over a little bit to the northwest quadrant, just a bit, and also to the southeast quadrant a bit. But really in that Cartesian reference frame focused on the northeastern quadrant, where we get the favored area of overlapping buoyancy and low level shear. Even with a southward moving system, it's not the right front quadrant that's favored because that entire quadrant is going to shift for a southward moving system into the southwest quadrant. That's not where we see the favorable overlap of ingredients. The physical principles that support and govern the poleward fluxes of higher theta air and the stronger pressure gradient that is driven by large scale processes will focus that overlap of cape and shear within the northeast quadrant and then surrounding sections of the adjacent northwest and southeast quadrants. As as he very directly specifies in his uh, 2012 study. And so that's going to be a very major focus area for tornado threat assessment as we look at the Gulf Coast state's vicinity in the day two convective outlook. So yet another case of some remedy effectively for um, the various instabilities in the atmosphere manifesting itself in a heightened severe weather threat. All right, so another one of the more tricky nuanced patterns we're going to talk about is one that's much more characterized by subtle forcing for ascent compared to what I've illustrated here off the coast. And so this is going to be really focused across parts of the upper Mississippi Valley region. Um, what you'll see in me talking about this is a convectively enhanced mesoscale vortex advancing through the quasi-zonal mid-level flow pattern um, near and downstream of this ridge across parts of the north central states, which I'm going to mark over here. Um, that convectively enhanced disturbance is going to be associated with what wants to be a weak frontal system crossing or grazing parts of that plume of recycled moisture. And the low level mass fluxes uh, preceding that disturbance are going to promote some poleward protrusion of the recycled moisture into parts of the upper Mississippi Valley region, and what wants to be a weak frontal system evolving along the bounds of that protruding moisture field, as you can see over here. Now, it's not going to be anywhere as strongly forced as what I've illustrated here, because we're not dealing with a particularly salient mid-level perturbation advancing through the flow. And we're dealing with something that's much more subtle, in this case an MCV, or mesoscale convective vortex. And so you can also see that by the fact that this is going to be associated in, or rather driven by convective processes, those are going to have the potential to influence the actual locations of the affected boundary. And what we're going to translate to now actually will be um, looking at the details of the day two convective outlook, uh, specifically at how we can leverage convection parameterized model guidance, the coarser resolution model guidance, um, and some awareness of the observations in particular to really help us sketch out the bounds of the overall severe threat 
and get some idea on where we are in terms of the spectrum of moisture and stability lift and vertical wind shear from a larger scale perspective to hone in on the overall expanse and bounds of the threat, effectively laying out a roadmap for how the severe weather threat may play out on the day two time period.